Hello and welcome to today's group meeting seminar. Today we have Dan Grimmer, Dr. Daniel Grimmer, uh, who's uh, actually uh, also a PhD fellow in Oxford uh, and is at the same time his uh, postdoc, uh, visiting postdoc in our group Barry RQI. Today he's going to tell us about his last work, uh, two discrete analogs of general covariance. Could the world fundamentally uh, be fundamentally set on a lattice? Okay, Dan, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Eduardo. So, so I used to be uh, a PhD student in Eduardo's group, and then I graduated, yes, and then I went off to Oxford to do philosophy of physics. Uh, and this is one of my first big uh, philosophy of physics uh, topics. So I'm really happy to be sharing it with you all. Um, so let's just let's just jump into it. So I'll be talking yeah, about two discrete analogs of general covariance, and I'd hope to answer the question, uh, could the world be fundamentally set on a lattice? And uh, I have a pretty strong reason that the answer should be no here, that the world can't be that way. Uh, but we'll, we'll see what you think of the argument. So oh, next slide, there we go. Okay, so, so when I say lattice, first let's just get in clear in mind what I'm thinking about exactly. So as two examples to get us started, consider the continuum heat equation, which is there on the top line, uh, that the derivative in time of some field phi is proportional to its second derivative in space, right? That's the continuum heat equation that might describe how heat is spreading out in uh, on a metal surface or on any space really, right? And let's then consider two discrete versions of that, which is set on either a square lattice or a hexagonal lattice. And I've got some pictures there to guide us along. There we go. Okay, so here are two sets of dynamics you might consider with nearest All right, so uh, we were talking about these uh, lattice theories, the sorts of lattice theories I'm considering here, right? And, and I wanna say some things at the end about quantum gravity uh, possibly, and I know they have more sophisticated lattice theories than these, but, but I just wanna stick with the simplest things so we can get the message across, right? So uh, here, two theories I've called H4 and H5 are the uh, heat equation on these lattices, one square and one hexagonal with nearest neighbor interactions. So on the left-hand side, we have the derivative of the field at N and M. And on the right-hand side, we have the nearest thing you can come up with to a second derivative using just nearest neighbor interactions, right? So those are the sorts of things I'm thinking about here. Um, and I wanna think, I wanna take very seriously the possibility that the world could be like that, that the world could at the bottom be some sort of lattice or with some sort of dynamics, not exactly like that, but something like that, right? So what if the world really was that way? In intuitively, it seems like the world might be fundamentally set on a lattice and indeed quantum gravity seems to point us towards that sort of thing. And it seems all very plausible or at least possible, right? So that by investigating the world on the smallest scales, we might discover that there are microscopic symmetry violations, maybe only quarter turns or one sixth turns and not continuous rotations are allowed or preserve the dynamics. So Dan, right. can, I intuitively ask these... can I ask one question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what do you yeah. say that intuitively the world might be, what is your argument for intuition that uh, the world might be set on a lattice? So what would be the starting intuition that may, would make somebody think that? What do you say that quantum gravity seems to point towards this? How? Because, for example, in, yeah. if it, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's well, there's pretty uh, standard arguments in quantum gravity which lead people to things like loop quantum gravity or causal set theory. Something like there has to be some smallest length scale set by the Planck length, or or something along these lines. And it doesn't have to be a, a lattice which resolves that sort of tension. And, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but but when I say might here, I really mean just very. Metaphysically, it seems possible, like the world could be that way. I'm not talking about the actual okay. physical, world, but any it's possible that the world could be fundamentally set on a lattice. I, I, right? I would actually so argue that quantum gravity doesn't. I would actually argue that quantum gravity doesn't really actually point to a, a discrete lattice uh, space-time. To be honest, most quantum. No, I, I agree, and that's actually that's actually very near to the conclusion of the talk. Okay. Uh, that I'm giving. I just here. I just mean that it's it's you know a possible world that the world might be. There's nothing contradictory about it. You might go out. You might do empirical investigations, and you might find this. Right. It's one way the world could turn out to be. That's really all I mean here. Right. Right. And, and people do take this seriously for quantum gravity reasons. So it is a very serious uh, contender for for what the world might be like. 
not these exact theories, but something like them, right? Um, right. So, so I, I just mean in the realm of possibilities, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna depart from the real world a bit here, um, but but just consider what it would mean if we did uh, these things I'm about to say. So consider if if we went and investigated the world on the smallest scales and we found something like these lattice artifacts, which seem to reflect the discrete symmetries of the underlying lattice structure, right? That's, that's something that could happen. We could go and find this, right? And if you, if you then believe that there is this uh, lattice structure underlying the world, what you might do is try to investigate that further and discover what kinds of interactions there are on this lattice. Is it nearest neighbors or next to nearest neighbors or infinite range or, or something, right? And intuitively, one could discover which of these it is through microscopic investigations. And by could, I just mean in the realm of possibilities. This could be a way that history turns out, in fact. Um, so suppose that after much empirical investigation, we found this, suppose that we did find such lattice artifacts and suppose that we have really great predictive success when we model the world in that way as being set on, for instance, a square lattice with next to nearest neighbor interactions. Just suppose just for the sake of argument that that sort of theory is extremely empirically successful. Now, would that just the mere empirical success of this theory prove that the world is fundamentally set on a lattice? Um, I, I think the answer is pretty clearly no, that just that alone wouldn't, doesn't prove this. The empirical success of our theories doesn't tell us how to interpret them. All that the, would confirm is that the world could be faithfully represented on such a lattice with such interactions, at least empirically. The, the world just has this as a representation. Um, but that doesn't tell us how we ought to interpret our theories. I, I'm here now in the business of doing philosophy about physics. So I, I care very much about how we're supposed to interpret these theories. Um, and that's something you're going to have to do extra work for, is right. Anything can be represented in any number of ways. We have different representations, which are all empirically equivalent of quantum theory. We have different uh, coordinate representations of the same sorts of gravitational systems. We, we have very many ways to represent things. And you need to do some extra empirical work on top of proving your theory works empirically, you have to do some extra work to know which parts of your theory are representing real things and what parts you should take seriously, which parts are substantive and which parts are merely representational, right? So this is the sort of where the philosophy comes in and now I'm going to try and interpret these theories and see what possibly we could um, extract from them in terms of what they're claiming that the world is like. So let's assume we have a lattice theory which is extremely empirically successful, right? And let's start from there, right? So we can't just straightforwardly take the lattice, which appears in that to be uh, a serious uh, indication of what there is in reality. We have to do some extra arguments. And so let's, let's then give those arguments. So why should we take this lattice structure seriously? It seems like the following claims about lattice structure are all very highly intuitive. Firstly, it seems like they restrict our symmetries. A theory that's set on a square lattice, it intuitively can only have the symmetries of that lattice. It might have discrete shifts and quarter turns and certain mirror reflections, and very similarly for the hexagonal lattice, but with one sixth rotations, right? So it seems like the lattice does the job of restricting symmetries in our theories. And it also seems like this distinguished two theories, two theories that have different lattice structures, like the square or hexagonal one, intuitively they can't be equivalent to each other, right? As I just mentioned, they have different symmetries. And the last reason we might want to take these uh, lattice structures seriously as part of our theories is that they seem to be very fundamental, fundamentally baked into the theories and the mathematics. The, the lattice in one of these discrete theories uh, is what the fundamental fields phi are defined over, if we take those to be the fundamental fields, right? And they play this very central structural role in determining and capturing the theory's symmetries, right? So, so ultimately, it seems like for these reasons, on top of those empirical success reasons that I talked about earlier, for these reasons, you would want to take that lattice structure very seriously in these theories. But as I'm going to argue in this in this talk, and I do argue in the paper, uh, none of that, none of those three points I just raised are true. Uh, lattice structures don't restrict our symmetries; they don't restrict, they don't distinguish our theories from one another, and they're certainly not fundamental a fundamental part of the theory. Um, so in the paper, what I do is I develop and I argue for a very rich analogy between the lattice structures that appear in our discrete space-time theories and coordinate systems that appear in our continuum space-time theories. So I really am hitting this analogy very hard here. And that analogy, as I'm going to argue, is confirmed in three ways. Firstly, neither the lattice structures nor the coordinate systems restrict our symmetries in any way. As I'm going to convince you, 
theories which are set on the lattice can and do in fact have continuous translation and continuous rotation symmetries. And this is analogous to the fact about coordinate systems that we can have rotation invariant systems, for instance, described in Cartesian coordinates. There's, there's really no reason for the symmetries of the thing we're talking about, the thing being represented, to line up with the symmetries of the representation that we use to, to represent it. Secondly, uh, both are interchangeable, coordinate systems for coordinate systems and lattice structures for lattice structures, right? If you give me a theory which is described on some lattice, I can always give it to you back described in a different lattice. You give me a square theory, I hand you back a hexagonal theory, and that process of exchanging lattice structures for each other is just as easy as switching coordinates. And finally, both are ultimately optional. Um, given a theory described on some lattice, uh, I can always reformulate it for you to reference no lattice at all. And this is analogous to giving a continuum theory a generally covariant uh, that is a coordinate free formulation. And that, that's where the title of the talk comes from. I'm, I'm going to present to you two discrete analogs of general covariance. So the takeaway message from all of this is that lattice structures are ultimately coordinate-like representational artifacts and that we ought to interpret them as such. So that, that's the overview of the talk. That's the direction I'm gonna head in. So that's the introduction and the claims. The, the structure of the talk is first, I'm gonna make a first attempt at interpreting these discrete theories. And this will turn out to be naive. It's gonna be very convincing at the time, but upon reflection, our first attempt is gonna be quite naive. Our second attempt will do better, uh, but it's going to have some problems with it. Then to fix those problems, I'm gonna review the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theory, and then I'll make a final attempt at interpreting these discrete theories, uh, and this one's gonna turn out best. And then I'll end by collecting together all of the interpretations or all of the lessons we've learned along the way uh, into two analogs of general covariance here. Okay, so let, let's get started with the first uh, attempt at interpreting these theories. So let's take these initial formulations of the theories that I showed before. So we have the square heat equation and the hexagonal heat equation. By, by the way, they numbered H4 and H5 to line up with the numbering in the paper. All right, so what do these theories seem to be about? Well, if you take them very seriously and, and just look at the theories, these dynamical equations, they seem to be about this field here, phi L of T, which maps lattice sites and times into some temperatures R, right? That is, it's a field phi, which maps from some space Q to V, where Q is the manifold, being the lattice sites existing across time, and, and the value space here is V, just being the space R of temperatures. So let's unpack this. If, if we take that field phi to be fundamental, then this Q thing is the manifold that's under these theories, and it's the entire manifold here. It's not embedded in some larger manifold, at least not on this interpretation. Uh, and V then is the space of these theories. But what's that then going to say about the symmetries of these theories? Basically, there are three types of symmetries uh, that one can identify. There's external symmetries, which are associated with automorphisms of the manifold. So automorphism of Q, there's internal symmetries associated with automorphisms of the value space. So these are just uh, structure preserving maps, which keep the manifold and keep the value space by, by changing things around. Right. And then there's gauge symmetries, which localize these internal symmetries on the manifold in some way. But I'm not going to be talking about gauge symmetries any, at any point in this talk. Um, right. but, but I've just talked about these automorphisms. Automorphism doesn't really mean anything unless you have a context for it. So what's, what automorphisms here are relevant? Um, so officially, I'm going to be neutral on this point, it doesn't really matter what you what you believe uh, for, for at least for making this argument. So for the sake of the argument, what I'd like to do is take these manifold and value space that we've identified here and take them to have as little structure as we sensibly can, right? And automorphisms are structure preserving transformations. So the less structure we have, the more transformations are going to be allowed and the more symmetries we could possibly have. So what I'm doing is maximizing the, the possible symmetries. So in particular, I'm gonna treat Q here like a set times a differentiable manifold, so that that space of the lattice sites L is just a set, right? And the automorphism group of a set is just a permutation group, right? So the automorphisms here of the manifold are just the permutation group on the lattice sites, and then some differential transformations on the uh, on the R space, right? So together, those give us permutations of the lattice sites, and then smooth time reparameterizations, right? So 
uh, that's how I'm going to treat that part of the thing. And then the other spot side on the value space, it's, it's, we have a linearity to our systems. We can sum solutions to solutions. So it turns out to be an, an affine vector space is the relevant space here. So the symmetries associated with that are linear affine rescaling of phi. And let me show you what those look like then here. So on this next slide, I've got a uh, field here. If that's fundamental, then what our symmetries are, are linear affine rescalings of phi. So C1 and C2 is a constant. So we rescale things and add some constant to it. We have some smooth time reperimperization tau here, and we have some permutation group P, which maps the lattice sites to the lattice sites. So taking into account all the symmetries we could expect to find in these theories, we have these sorts of symmetry transformations, right? And so if you look at this closely, you're gonna find there's really no room for continuous spatial translations and rotations here. Uh, we can have time shifts, which are a sort of time translation, but nothing in space, nothing that would seem like space could, could be here in terms of uh, translations and rotations, right? So let, let's start looking at the symmetries of the theories I've been talking about and, and see what they are. But first, let me, let me talk about this simplified theory, this uh, one-dimensional theory here, H1, I'm calling it, which is just a one-dimensional thing. And we have this nearest neighbor interaction given here by equation two at the bottom, right? So it's just uh, nearest neighbor interactions on a 1D lattice. So what are the symmetries of that H1 theory? It turns out the solution preserving transformations of the dynamics I just showed you, which have the form that I've been talking about here are given by these. We have discrete shifts, so we can take all the lattice sites and move them by n. We have a negation symmetry, which takes n to minus n. So this is a mirror reflection. We can do constant shifts in time, and we can do linear affine rescalings of the, the heat field, right? And that's, uh, it turns out, all the symmetries of this theory. And if you think about it, those are the symmetries of a uniform grid plus time shifts and linear affine rescalings, right? So if we didn't already know it, this is how we could figure out what the lattice structure underlying H1 is. Right. Okay, next we have the, uh, the 2D the heat equation, the one that was set on the square lattice, and you can look up its symmetries or, or compute them if you like, and here's what you'd find. You find discrete shifts in both directions. You have a negation symmetries in both directions, n to minus n, m to minus m. You'll now also have a fold symmetry, which sort of does your turn on the lattice. You have constant time shifts and you have linear affine rescalings. So if you look, at, these are all the symmetries of the theory which we talked about before. And these are the symmetries of the square lattice here, uh, plus time shifts and linear rescalings. And so if you didn't know already before, this is how you would discover that this theory is on a square lattice. And lastly, do this for H5. The other one's on a hexagonal lattice. And you find that you have discrete shifts in both directions. You have another mirror reflection symmetry. You now have a six-fold rotation symmetry. That third line there, if you apply that six times, you get back around to where you started. And constant time shifts and linear affine rescalings, right? And so these are the symmetries of a hexagonal lattice. And so if you didn't know beforehand, this is how you would figure out that H5 is on a hexagonal lattice. So uh, there's a couple more theories I want to talk about uh, and analyze, but I need to do some mathematical work to get to them. So, so just bear with me while I, I rewrite things in a way that's going to let me upgrade the uh, derivative approximations that we're using. So let's focus then back on this first example, H1. So there was the dynamics there for that, and we can... No. All right. Uh, so where was I? Um, Right, so I need to rewrite things a little bit so I can introduce two more theories. Uh, so, so let's um, take this uh, H1 theory here and collect all of the field values together into a vector here. So some now capital Phi vector here, which just lists all of these values in order. Right? And writing the dynamics of H1 in terms of this vector, we find this sort of thing. So we have now the derivative of this vector is proportional to some um, to some, uh, const or some, some linear operation on that vector, right? And I'm using Topolitz matrices here, which is, is diagonal constant matrices, right? So this Topolitz one minus two, one, that's uh, minus two down the main diagonal and one on the diagonal above that and the diagonal below that, right? And so the process to upgrade our derivative approximation when things are formulated this way is just to switch out what this matrix is, right? And so we can upgrade to the nearest, next to nearest neighbor approximation. 
here by just switching in this longer range derivative approximation, this topolit matrix there. So that gives us a second theory, H2. Uh, we can also consider a third theory, which I'll tell you about now is H3. So here we have the derivative in time of that vector is proportional to some operation D squared applied to that vector. And D squared is given by this infinite topolitz matrix here, which I'm showing on the screen. Um, and this is in some sense the best possible derivative approximation because it's, it's diagonal in the discrete Fourier basis with the spectrum of IK. And that's very analogous to the partial derivative having a spectrum of, of IK in the, in the continuum Fourier basis, right? So this is sort of what you get if you take our derivative approximations and make them infinite range. These are the unique best infinite range derivative approximations. That's what H3 is built off of. So we can do the same trick for H4 and H5. We can rewrite them in terms of a vector field here and now as well, but that vector field has a, a tensor product structure. So the first tensor factor is the first index and the second tensor factor corresponds to the second index, right? So you can rewrite those heat theories in this way here uh, where the subscript on the N means acting just on the first tensor factor and the subscript on the M means acting just on the second tensor factor. So you can go ahead and do that translation here as well. And then the last two theories I'd like to talk about, are, I'm calling them H6 and H7, are just those square heat theory and the hexagonal heat theory improved up to have this infinite range derivative operation. So we still start on the square lattice or a hexagonal lattice, uh, but now we have these improved um, derivative approximations, right? So what are the symmetries of these new theories, H6 and H7? Um, turns out H6 has the same symmetries of a square lattice, just like H4 did. Uh, and so we have found out that H6 has a square lattice underlying it, and H7 has the symmetries of a hexagonal lattice, just like H5 did. So we've discovered that it has a hexagonal lattice underlying it, right? And so H6 and H7, at least on this first interpretation, are very different theories. They have different lattice structures and different symmetries, and they just appear to be thoroughly different from each other, right? Okay, so that, that's the first interpretation of these theories, which I'd like to, which I've shared with you. And it seems like on these interpretations, it actually vindicates all of the intuitions we discussed earlier. It seems like the lattices, the lattices here are restricting our symmetries. It seems like the lattices are distinguishing theories from each other. We always have square theories versus hexagonal theories and they're not equivalent. And it, it seems like the lattice structures are here very fundamental in these theories, right? They, uh, what the fields are defined find over, and they're playing a very important role in the symmetries of the theory, right? So, so all of our first intuitions seem to be vindicated, at least on this first interpretation, uh, but, but I'm gonna uh, show you that that's wrong throughout the rest of the talk, right? So next I'll, I'll make a second attempt at interpreting these discrete theories. Um, so that first interpretation was highly intuitive, uh, but it, as I'm going to discuss now, it, it systematically underpredicts the symmetries of H1 to H7. I mean, surprisingly, each of H1 through H7, it turns out they have a hidden continuous translation symmetry, which was completely overlooked by our first analysis. And actually, H6 and H7, those last two with the improved derivatives, they have a continuous rotation symmetry, which was overlooked before. Right? So, so how could these things have been overlooked? If when we took this field phi, which mapped from the lattice sites, to be fundamental, we found we had a very restricted range of symmetries available to us, which had no room for continuous translations and rotations. In order to avoid that, we're gonna to have to stop treating that field phi as fundamental. And so on the second approach, luckily we have another option. We can take this uh, vector field, capital phi, the vector to be fundamental. It appears in these equations here. And so looking at then uh, these theories H4 and H5 as they're written here, what do these theories seem to be about? I mean, let's let's take these theories very seriously as they're written and think that they describe the world in, in its basic terms, right? So intuitively reading these theories off, we seem to be talking about a vector field, capital Phi here, which maps times into infinite dimensional vectors then, right? So we have a very different manifold and a very different value space on this read of the theory. And in particular, if we unpack this, what we're gonna find is that the manifold here is just times and that the value space here is an infinite dimensional vector space. So the, the lattice structure, which we had in our first interpretation has completely disappeared. Now it's been removed from the manifold and sort of internalized into the value space. 
This is a, a straightforward continuum space-time theory with, of the kind that we're very used to uh, interpreting. Right? So what does that say about the symmetries of this theory? We're going to play the same game as before and talk about the internal symmetries and the external symmetries. What we find is that the internal symmetries are automorphisms of that manifold, and the ex internal symmetries are the automorphisms of the value space. Right? But what, what automorphism is relevant here? What I'll do here is I'll treat the manifold like a differentiable manifold. So our external symmetries will be time reparameterizations, the same as before. And I'm going to treat our value space then like an affine vector space, right? Because again, we have this linearity of our solutions. So uh, putting those together, what we find is that the symmetries are now limited in a different way than before. What we find is these symmetry transformations that I'm showing on screen now, that we have this uh, general linear transformation lambda, which we apply to the vector. We do a time reparameterization, and then we can offset things in any direction C in that infinite dimensional vector space. Right. And so writing uh, our symmetries from before in these terms, we just had a permutation group here instead of a general linear transformation. So we have a much wider set of symmetries, which we're considering now. And there may be room in this wider set for continuous translation and rotation symmetries. And in fact, there are, as, as I'll tell you now. So going back to, to H1, let's look at its symmetries on the second interpretation. Looking through the symmetries, which are of this form here, where we apply this general linear transformation and offset and a uh, time reparameterization, what we find is something called action by T epsilon, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, but it's, it's, it basically replaces the discrete shifts. And then we also have the uh, negations and constant time shifts and linear affine rescalings. So we have discrete shifts upgraded into something else. And uh, let me just go through this quickly. The same thing is true for H4. If you look at that theory and find the symmetries, which are of this form for it, you find uh, here also action by T epsilon, which is a continuous translation operation, which replaces the discrete shifts. And you find the same thing for H5 as well. Let me just go through that quickly here. Uh, same symmetries as before with the six-fold symmetries and all those things. But now we have action by T epsilon, which is a continuous translation operator. Right? What do I mean by T epsilon? What, what is this continuous translation? operation. Um, it can be thought of as a continuous translation operation for three reasons. First, uh, T epsilon is the exponential of the derivative operator, that D thing, that discrete derivative operator. And it's in close analogy with, with uh, the exponential of the derivative being the tran generator of translations in the continuum as well. And secondly, if we take this epsilon parameter to be an integer, then this action by T epsilon, in fact, reduces to a map of discrete shifts by integer amounts on the lattice, right? And uh, T epsilon also obeys an addition law, T epsilon one to T epsilon two is T epsilon one plus T epsilon two. Um, so it's it's a representation of the translation group, right? And in particular, that means that there's something T one half that we can do twice to end up moving one space forward. And so here we have the first big lesson of the talk is that discrete theories in fact can and do have continuous translation symmetries and the fact that our theory was initially on a lattice really does nothing to stop this. It was, it was just hidden before, but it's, it was always there, right? Uh, on the second interpretation, we have some changes in which symmetries match with each other. So before we had H4 and H6 being our square lattice theories, and those were both on a square lattice and their symmetries matched each other. And H5 and H7 matched each other as well, being on a hexagonal lattice. But that's not true anymore here. What we have now is that, um, uh, these pairings break up and H6 and H7 actually have the same symmetries. And indeed, actually on, on this interpretation, H6 and H7 turn out to be completely equivalent to each other, despite the fact that one's in a square lattice and one's on a hexagonal lattice, right? All, the, all that you have to do to switch between them is make a change of basis on that value space, RL. So that vector space we're defining things on, just a change of basis there is all you need to move between a square lattice and a hexagonal lattice. And I don't have much time to talk about that now, but you can ask me about it or see the paper. Um, so we get two, two big lessons here. Now, our theories can be equivalent to each other, even when they appeared to be on different lattices at the start. And uh, we can take a theory which was initially described on some lattice, and we can switch it over to a different lattice, or we can remove the lattice from the theory altogether. Right. Uh, let me then go through this, the symmetries of H6 and H7. Then uh, we find the same symmetries as before, except now I'm saying we have a continuous rotation operation. 
So we have this action by R theta here, which, um, which upgrades the uh, quarter turns that we had before. And the symmetries of H7 are just the same as this because they're the same theory, just with a basis changed. Right? And what is this R action by R theta that I mentioned here? It's a continuous rotation operation in the following sense. It has this form. It's the exponential of these operators here, which are analogous to this, the rotation operation in the continuum being the exponential of these operations, x times partial y minus y times partial x. Right? So it really has the same structural form as that with the correct substitutions made. Um, when you take pi equals or theta equals to pi over 2, it gives back the quarter rotation map. Right? And it has this addition rule for composition, which makes it a representation of, of the rotation group. Right? So this really is a, a representation of rotations, right? which has appeared here. So our discrete theories, in fact, can and do have continuous rotation symmetries, even when they were initially set on a lattice. Right. So, so the second interpretation, we actually learned a lot of things which undermine first interpretation. Um, let me tell you what they are. So these discrete theories, they can and do have continuous translation and rotation symmetries. Uh, the fact that our theories were initially on the lattice really doesn't stop this. Uh, theories can be equivalent to each other even when they initially appeared on different lattices and we can switch between lattices um, and we can also go with no lattice at all, right? So, but there, there are some issues with the second interpretation which are a bit satisfying. The lattice here is sort of external. It's, or it should be external part of the manifold sort of, and not internal like it's being treated here. And these continuous translation and rotation symmetries, they're here, they're internal symmetries. They're symmetries of the value space. They're not symmetries of the manifold, like intuitively they should be. And so I can fix all of these issues then by externalizing these symmetries. But in order to that, I'm gonna have to, in order to do that, I'm gonna have to tell you a bit about the nyquist and sampling theory. And this is a very quick overview. I think a lot of you have seen this stuff before, but if you haven't, I, I think this gets the message across. So consider this function here, FB, which has the special property of being band limited. I'll tell you what that means in a second. But a, a consequence of that is that we can reconstruct this FB from its sample points only at a few select locations. In particular, if we know this function only at the half integers here, then it being band limited is enough for us to recover the function exactly. How do we recover the function from those sample points? What we do is we associate a shifted and rescaled sync function to each of these sample points, right? So the sync function is sine of pi x over pi x. We associate one of those with each sample point. We do that for all the sample points, and then we add these together, and that gives you back the original function with no approximation. So what is then, math, how does that work mathematically? Um, what is a band-limited function? A band-limited function is one which has no high frequencies in it. And more technically, a band-limited function is one whose Fourier transform has a compact support. So that the function fb is band-limited with some bandwidth k when its Fourier transform has support only for wave numbers k less than k, right? And here is the... Uh, equation for the function I showed before. It's this combination of, of uh, sinks uh, and it's band as pi, right? So if we have some band limited function, then mathematically, how does the reconstruction work? What you do is you take those sample values uh, at these regularly spaced sample points, and then you do exactly what the picture said. You put them together in some linear combination multiplied by these sink functions, and this gives you back the original function with no approximation. And that's the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theory. As long as the spacing A is less than some A star, which is pi over K, then it turns out that this reconstruction is exact. And there's really no approximations going on here. So uh, we can also do that with another sampling here, just to show you the generality of this. If we sample this at every integer spacing, but offset by a third, you can also reconstruct that from the exactly the same uh, technique, what you do is associate a sync function again with each of the points and add them all up. And this gives you the initial function back with no approximation at all, right? So we can reconstruct these band limited functions from really any, um, um, any uh, uniform sampling of them. But that, that's really not the real magic of the nyquist and sampling theory. The real magic is that we can also do that with non-uniform samplings. Here, uh, I can show you that. I can take this 
function here and sample it every one quarter. So every one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, I have in essence four times as many sample points as I need to reconstruct the function. And so what I can do is I can throw away three quarters of them. And it turns out I don't have to do that uniformly. I can throw them away in basically a random way. And what I'll find then is a, re a representation like this. And from these non-uniform sample points, I can also reconstruct the function. I do the same as before. I associate some function with each of these sample points. Uh, and the functions are more complicated now, but you're doing it and you add them all together. And then you get back the original function with no approximation. Right. So this is a really powerful tool that you oh, can Dan, use if, if uh, in representing your theory. Yes. yes. There's a, it's, even, it's even more impressive. Uh, right? Because you, could, oops, you could actually uh, uh, consider that you're sampling very densely, but only in a small region. And very small region, and you say, OK, if I measure here, if I get a sampling that I'm sampling the function only in a very small region, I can actually get the function very far yep. away. So basically, it's telling you that by limited function, yeah. all the global information is kind of contained locally, quote unquote, in a very small, in a very small, in every yeah. every single yeah. small yeah. That, that's yeah, that that's true. That's true uh, for band limited functions. It's also just true for analytic or right. uh, yeah. complex differentiable functions. You know, entire functions. That's right. Um, Anything which Taylor series converge, converges everywhere. It, it's sort of something along the lines of this. I know all the derivatives in some local patch, and I, I know uh, then the function value everywhere. Right? I think yeah, it's just to say because, because conditions like being analytic or being bad limited are extremely constraining. Mm -hmm. I said, like, uh, if you are that, if you know a little bit about the, well, a little bit, you know a lot about the function. But if you only know a small region in which the function is defined, you can actually predict what the function is going to be everywhere because they don't have much freedom to be anything they want, yeah. Right, right. So they do have a lot of constraints placed on them, but operationally, actually, they're completely sufficient to basically describe everything we see around us. The, uh, that, the, that the music you listen debate. to. That, that is open for debate, though, that, yeah, that we can talk about it later on, whether the set of well, yeah, the, is... the, the music on is band limited. They, they, they cut off the high frequencies and low frequencies yeah. from this because you can't hear them anyway. Yeah, you see, and then, and then I, they I downsample it and, and put it on. I would phone. actually yeah. uh, technically disagree. Well, of course I agree. I technically disagree in the sense that they are not band limited, strictly band limited. They are weakly band limited in the sense that you still have tails. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, right, right. Yeah. And, and that is a big difference because I was actually asking Achim about this stuff. Okay, can you reproduce the same uh, results in sampling theory that you have? If your functions are actually weakly but limited. And you say, okay, given a degree of experimental precision, sure, because you assume that you're going to have a degree of experimental precision in your band limited. But if you, when you're describing something fundamental, it makes a big difference, right? The Fourier transforms of things that are band limited. So the spatial extension of those functions has uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, sub uh, exponential tails in the sense that they cannot be suppressed like exponential which is the way in physics, which we typically say things are considered localized at least, right? So we can discuss that at the end, yeah. it's a bit of an off topic, but I think it's a very interesting off topic, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. so this is something I'm very interested in exploring is, is to what extent uh, we can do all of our physics with band limitations. I'd right? be very down It's basically that, taking though. a UV. Yeah. Um, Right. Uh, one way to implement these band limitations is to take a UV cutoff. And I'm, I'm fairly certain that if we take that UV cutoff at the Planck scale, then no experiment could tell the difference. Okay, let, let, me, let me say it in a different um, way. No, I, it's not taking a UV cutoff. It's taking a hard UV cutoff, and that's the key. If you take a soft UV, UV, UV cutoff, yeah. you don't have a band limited function anymore. See what I mean? You're basically saying yeah, that yeah. hard so cutoff. We're talking about a very hard UV cutoff here. Yeah. Yeah. which makes a big difference. But again, I don't want to interrupt more. We can talk about it afterwards if you want, because it's interesting in itself. Yeah, okay. yeah. no, it, it'll affect the, the basically the shape of things, as you can see with that, that paper that you did with Emma and Adrian, right? But um, anyway, yeah, let's, let, me, let me continue on because I'm, I'm nearing the end here. Um, so uh, we have this non-uniform sampling theory, but what's really, really cool is that this thing works out the same in higher dimensions as well. So, uh, I'm going to show you a function here, and don't worry about what exactly the function is. It's a Bessel function divided by r. Um, but what you do is this has a bandwidth of k equals pi. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures now. Uh, but each of these pictures is, is equivalently a representation of this function. So we can just show it as a band-limited function, or we could show it sampled every half integer, 
or we could show it sampled every integer, or we could do it on a rotated square less, or we could do it on a hexagonal lattice, or we could do it on a completely irregular lattice and reconstruct the function from there with, again, no approximation. Right? So we have really quite a few ways we can represent uh, these band-limited functions. Right? OK, so last part of the talk, I'd like to make a third attempt at interpreting these discrete theories. And this one's going to come out the best. Um, it uses these tools I just talked about. So to review what the situation is, our first attempt at interpreting these theories it systematically underpredicted their symmetries. We didn't have any continuous translation or rotation symmetries. And these, in fact, turned out to be to show up in our second attempt at interpreting them. We had these hidden symmetries are now exposed, right? But unfortunately, this classified them as internal symmetries, whereas intuitively they seem to be external symmetries, right? Related to translations and rotations in space. So the third attempt I'm going to give you will externalize these symmetries by using band-limited functions and sampling theories. Right? So let's start again from our discrete equations. Let's take H1 here, which was this heat equation here. In order to associate that with some band-limited function, what we're going to have to do is define a manifold and sample points for it. And I, I talk about this a lot in the paper, but we have a lot of freedom in how we're going to pick these manifolds and sample points that we're going to map onto. Um, the simplest thing that we can do, that's what I'll show you here today, is, is taking these sample points to be uniformly spaced in on the manifold and sorting through time together. So picking a manifold and putting the points on it in this way, what we get is, is a reconstruction of that band-limited function by summing over all those sync functions, just as in the uh, just as in the previous section, right? So Doing that, what you can do is you can take the discrete dynamics that say how all these discrete values phi n evolve with respects to each other, and you can find the dynamics of the band-limited function from that. And I'm showing now a computation on the screen, but don't worry about the details of it. So the, the derivative in time of the band-limited field, you work that out and you compute it, compute it, and it turns out to be that the derivative in time of that band-limited field is some complicated differential operation applied to the, the field, right? And this is, in particular, it's not the continuum heat equation. In the continuum heat equation, you have the second derivative appearing there at the end, uh, whereas here we have the hyperbolic cosine of the derivative, which is some nasty, crazy thing, right? It involves infinitely many powers of the derivative and is so a very non-local operation, I should mention that. Um, but if we expand that thing for small a, then the first leading term in that is just the second derivative. And so this means that in the continuum limit, we're going to get back the continuum heat equation. So, but, but outside that limit, we have some non-localities appearing in these theories, right? And we can do the same for H4 and for H5. And I'll show you those here on the screen now. Again, you find that the differential equations involve some hyperbolic cosines of derivatives, right? And now all three of the theories that I've showed you here are translation invariant, but none of them are rotation invariant, right? So these discrete theories, they do come out translation invariant when we write them on a band limited, in terms of band limited functions, right? And um, we can do the same thing for our improved heat equations, the one with the infinite range derivatives and doing those for H6 and H5, you find these equations for them. These equations, it turns out are equal to each other. So they have the same dynamics H6 and H7 do. Uh, and these are both translation and rotation invariant, these dynamics, and they exactly match the continuum heat equation. So our, our first big lesson is revised here. Again, we can also have rotation symmetries as well as uh, translation symmetries here. So these two theories, H6 and H7, which were our square lattice, square heat theory and our hexagonal heat theory with upgraded derivatives, remember that, they're the same as each other here. And ultimately on the third interpretation, the only difference between H6 and H7 is that H6 was sampled on a square lattice, whereas H7 was sampled on a hexagonal lattice. And so what we find is that our second lesson is revised here. Our theories can be equivalent to each other even when they initially appeared with different lattice structures, right? So uh, now I'm gonna show you some pictures of time evolution uh, and to show you that these discrete representations and the continuous representations really match each other. So here on the screen is H4. Uh, I have the discrete equation for it and the continuous equation for it in the band-limited uh, framing. 
So we have the continuous, uh, we have an initial condition here, which is a band limited function, which is rotation invariant. And what you can do is you can sample that on the square lattice and then evolve that forward with our square heat equation, the discrete one, and then reconstruct from that an, a band limited function again. But you could also just skip from the first picture to the fourth picture just by applying the band limited dynamics directly. So that's the sense in which the discrete and continuous dynamics match each other. Right? And the same thing is true for H5. You can take this theory here and sample it on a hexagonal lattice, evolve that forward with the discrete equations, and then reconstruct, and you get some band limited function at the end. And you could find that band limited function alternatively by just applying this dynamics directly from the initial condition in its band limited form to the final condition. And the same thing's true of H6 here. Here's its discrete equation and its continuous equation. And you can do the same trick about sampling, evolving, and then reconstructing there. You can do the same thing for H7 as well. And you get the same thing. You sample this on a hexagonal lattice and then evolve forward and reconstruct, right? So uh, we have discrete representations and continuous representations for each of these dynamics and they match each other. What you can see though here uh, on slide 72, if you're there, uh, the dynamical symmetries here seem to follow with the lattice symmetries in the pictures I showed, if you look at them closely. So H4 and H5 seem as though the symmetries of the dynamics matches on to the symmetries of the lattice. If you look at the evolution by H4, we sampled it on a square lattice. And if you look at the end, there's a sort of square distortion to the state at the end. And on the second line, we have a hexagonal sampling, a hexagonal distortion at the end, right? But that's, that's not gonna be the case in general. That's just happens to be the case with these two theories I was talking about. What you can do, I'm showing on slide 73, is you can represent this evolution by the square heat equation on any lattice that you like. So we can sample it on a square lattice and evolve forward in time, or we could do the same on a hexagonal lattice, or we could do the same on an irregular lattice. And in each of these cases, reconstructing the final state gives us the exact same state at the end. And each of these states have this uh, square looking distortion to them, even, even when it's with sample on a hexagonal lattice, for instance. And you can do the same thing with the uh, hexagonal heat equation. So that hexagonal dynamics that H5 gives is, uh, can be done on any lattice that you'd like, a square lattice, a hexagonal lattice, or an irregular lattice. And the same thing's true of H6 and H7, which again are equivalent to each other. You can get this rotation invariant dynamics, which preserves the rotation invariance of the state while sampling it on any, any of these lattices that you like, right? So what, what all these figures ultimately show is that we can represent any band limited dynamics on any lattice, just as we can represent any band limited state on any lattice. And indeed we can do so with no lattice at all by moving to a uh, band limited representation of the function, right? So given a theory set on some lattice, we can reformulate it into reference a different lattice if we like, or indeed we can do no lattice at all. Okay, so that's our third attempt at interpreting these theories. And now these symmetries show up as external symmetries, which is very intuitive as, as to how they should be, right? And we've, we've seen all the rotation and translation variants very, very clearly in this third one, right? So let me summarize and, and tell you what the lessons we have learned along the way are here. Our pre-theoretic intuitions about these lattice structures were that they are restricting our symmetries that they are uh, fundamental and that they, they distinguish our theories and that they're fundamental, right? But, but as I hope I've convinced you by now, none of that's correct. Lattice structures don't restrict our symmetries. We can have continuous translation and continuous rotation symmetries. Uh, lattice structures are interchangeable with each other and uh, ultimately they're optional and we can get rid of them by reformulating in terms of band limited functions. And really, if you think about it, this is exactly the same sort of thing which goes on with coordinate systems. Coordinate systems really don't restrict our symmetries at all. We have a free choice in how to represent our physics going on with anyone that we like. And ultimately they're optional and we can get rid of them by moving into differential geometry and, and giving things a, a generally covariant formulation. So what you can do then is take this analogy and try and flesh it out a bit. And so I find two analogies here corresponding to the second and third interpretations I gave. So. On the second interpretation, we internalize the lattice. And so that's one way of doing things. We then find coordinate systems are analogous to lattice structures. Changing coordinates is like changing lattice structures. And that's what here was realized as a change of basis in the value space. 
And the generally covariant formulation where we get rid of the coordinates altogether is what we did by internalizing things. We moved all the lattice structure into a value space and made it infinite dimensional there. And that got rid of the lattice structure. Uh, and we also have another picture with this external differential or discrete general covariance where we did um, coordinate systems or lattice structures, changing coordinates was like a nyquist shannon resampling. So doing the sampling theory trick of moving between different lattices and writing things in a generally covariant form is um, writing things in terms of band limited functions, right? So we have these two analogies going on, these two ways of handling lattice structure. Um, both of them agree that the structure is really not anything like a fixed background structure or an underlying manifold, like you might have thought it was. Rather, it's more like a coordinate system. It's merely a representational artifact which appears in our theories. These two different analogs I'm talking about, once the lattice structure has been revealed to be coordinate-like and representation dependent, they differ about what they do with it. Do they embed it in a further continuous manifold or do they take it out of the manifold and embed it into some value space? Right, so what they do with the lattice is different, but they both agree that it's a representational uh, part of our theory and not anything substantive, right? And so these two approaches pick out different manifolds and as a consequence, they license very different conclusions about locality uh, and they classify all the symmetries differently. And so they're very different ways of handling the lattice, uh, but, but ultimately they agree that the lattice is not anything uh, substantive in our theory, right? So this has a lot of, consequences for the philosophy of space and time, uh, which is where I want to take this stuff, uh, but I'm sure you all have questions and, and about this as well. What I think this shows is that the lattice structure, which supposedly underlies any discrete lattice theory, has the same level of physical import as coordinates do, which is to say none at all. Uh, it really is deflationary about how seriously we should take lattice structures in our theories. And secondly, I think that the world can't be fundamentally set on a square lattice or any other lattice for that matter any more than it could be fundamentally set in a certain coordinate system. Like, like coordinate systems, lattice structures just, are just not the sort of things that can be fundamental. They're, they're really both thoroughly merely representational and can't be, can't be taken too seriously as substantive parts of our theories. Um, and so in conclusion, I think that space-time can't be a lattice, even when it might be representable as such, right? So you, your theory might be a band-limited theory and it might have discrete lattice representations, and you can maybe talk about it in that way, but those really are just representational artifacts, and those aren't the real fundamental representation of your theory, right? So the world might be representable as discrete, but the world uh, can't be fundamentally discrete in this way. All right, I, I'd appreciate any questions. Um, I hope I hope you all, uh, the audio was okay with all that. Yeah, it improved. And the video was synced up. I I have uh, several questions, I'm sure other people would too. Uh, uh, let's chat a little bit about the messages to extract. I, I fully agree with, so I guess I'm not the standard audience for the talk in the sense that I fully agree with everything you said, mostly from the beginning, meaning like there's no surprises here uh, uh, on my side. But here's here's one thing. Yeah. Though. So it's the, the way that logically you're putting up the argument is saying, well, if you will insist on giving some fundamental importance to some discrete structures, I think everybody, whether people believe in the world is fundamentally a lattice or not, would agree on the following. Having a bad limited theory is to all intents and purposes the same and equivalent 100% to having a theory on a lattice. Because you know you can represent one as the other or the other as the one. Which one you assign the value of fundamental is up to yeah. you. It's basically the same. And uh, the one thing that you uh, say- That's not at all what I'm saying here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me try to, let me try to, so this is what everybody would agree on, I think. But what you say, let me try to see yeah. if I understood what you're saying. What you're saying is that the yeah. question itself of considering if a lot is fundamental is a moot point whatsoever. Because uh, the, the choice of representation, so then you're seeing that doing a theory of unlimited function, doing a theory of a lot is just a choice of representation and can never be fundamental because I am, I am arguing, or that that with you, I am arguing that representations cannot be physical. And therefore, the theories of representations cannot correspond to fundamental physical issues. Therefore, discussing whether a lattice is a fundamental construct for our space time or not is a moot point. Is that it, more or less? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's more or less what you've said. Yeah, so I, I agree with the first point that these, these sorts of uh, lattice theories slash band-limited theories are just representations of the same thing, right? 
Um, so, so you can switch back and forward between these discrete and continuous representations. This is something Akim has known for a long time. Um, and he, he, of course, inspires a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think, I think but yeah, so now, once you have two, sorry? No, I was just saying that this is kind of common yeah. knowledge. Uh, the people in pure math that or in analysis, right, that works with this is like, yeah, having a cutoff, a hard cutoff, or having a discrete theory, yeah, there's, there's no different, right? If anything, they may argue, well, what I'm talking is fundamentally a lattice in terms of space time is the fact that the theory is one of those that you can choose either a bad limited continuous theory or a lattice theory, right? Mm -hmm. that, they will tell you that that is the discrete yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. the question becomes more right. relevant. Um, is the universe, is it reasonable? Because this also connects with something I'm taking a look at by myself, and I was hoping that I can get people in the group interested too, which is the fact that, okay, what happens when you don't have strong band limitation. So imagine that instead of having a hard cutoff, I have a softer cutoff, but yeah. basically band limited. You see, imagine yeah. that in reality, I work with functions that are basically band limited, but imagine that they're very strongly suppressed right. in the high frequency. Many of those things don't carry, but of course, approximately many do carry, you know what I mean? So it, looking at a theory right, that right. are weakly band limited hasn't been, well, I don't know, maybe I don't know all the literature, but I don't see that many people have actually worked on this because typically people default to bad limited for this kind of analysis. And it could be interesting, connect with something that right, I'm interested right. in looking at with Jose and some things that I'm looking on my own and some things that I hope that get more people in the group interested in. So maybe Dan, we can definitely chat in the future about all this if you're interested because it, I think it's extremely related. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in exploring uh, some of those things, but but just, just to... Uh, finalize what I was saying about what the argument is because you're, you're mostly right about it. Yeah. So we have these theories which have equivalent representations in the discrete sense and a continuous sense, right? But then, I mean, when you hand this to a philosopher or somebody who's trying to interpret the theory and saying, okay, you have this thing, but what's it say that the world is like? I mean, uh, we have these different equivalent representations of our theories, then we have to go somehow beyond empirical support, because they're both equally empirically supported if they're supported, you know, uh, we have to go somehow past that and do some interpretive work of our theories to see which of these representations is better, which one is more likely to be how the world really is. And so what I've done here is I've talked about it from that perspective and shown how switching between these different discrete theories feels a lot like, or discrete representations feels really a lot like switching between coordinate systems. And so the, the move is that we should interpret these discrete representations in the same way that we interpret coordinate systems, right? right. Uh, and so, and so by analyzing these two empirically equivalent representations of the theory, I find that one of them is much more likely to be the real thing. And the other one is just a, a, a convenient or accidental way of expressing the theory, which is not fundamentally what's going on in the world. If I, I'm not sure right. I've, been I, I've been convinced about almost everything uh, you've said, but not that there's one that's better than the other. Uh, because uh, to, to, you can also look at it the other way, right? You can also say that the theory of unlimited functions is just a choice of representation for the reality, which could be. So it's as bad. I feel, I feel it's as bad, right? It's picking one set of coordinates in a way, because also the theory of unlimited functions is a choice of representation, right? So what what breaks the symmetry between the two? Why do you think one is better than the other? You think one is better than the other? Um. Well, the 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 real issue, I guess, is that the the discrete representations. There are too many of these representations, and moving between them feels a lot like switching coordinates, right? Um, that doesn't happen on the band limited thing. I mean, once you put the band limited function on a manifold, you may have coordinates on that manifold, but then you can go ahead and rewrite that in terms of uh, in terms of uh, differential uh, geometry as well, and you can and I do that in the paper. So so I mean. These two interpretations of the theory are uh, don't seem to be equivalent to me. All that, all that I mean is that the manifold could be one or the other, right? Meaning, like uh, uh, what you pick to be the fundamental one seems still a little bit. Well, if if the, if the manifold is any one of these discrete representations, then it gets the symmetries wrong. Right. Right. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna so so the, 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 the symmetries are more naturally expressed in one formulation than in the other. That's one reason to think one's better. But this than the is other. a kind of an Occam's razor kind of family of argument, right? It's not really inspired more that we, we like it better. It's more aesthetically pleasing for humans. Is that what you mean? Well, well that, that's that's what philosophy of science <laughs> and physics is about. These, these two theories, I've conceded that they're empirically equivalent to each other.
right? Right, right. Um, and then the, the task is then to find out which of these representations is is more there is metaphysically third, plausible, which is more likely option. to be right. There's which one? Option. Yeah. There's a third option, right? To say that neither of them, none of them actually are. There's something that is the truth, and all of those are just uh, ways of representing it that don't carry any physical uh, fundamental value, right? But again, this has been more empiricist, mm -hmm. right? In the sense that we are not really. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I don't think these theories are the final. I don't think these theories I'm proposing here are the final theories, right? But right. even even when you think your theories right. are not the final theory, you ought to still go about trying to seriously interpret them and find out what the right way to think about them is, if only to give you a clearer idea of how to move on to the next theory. Right. right? Okay, I'm gonna leave room because that's um, three people, or well, at least like, lower bound of three people. Let me just make one point about. That. One more point about, about that. We right. have for quantum theory, for non-relativistic quantum theory, we have Bohmian theory and we have um, Heisen, and we have all, all the Schrodinger pic, not Schrodinger picture, the uh, Copenhagen interpretation and the Everett interpretation and all these things. So we have all these different empirically equivalent representations of the theory. Uh, and people argue endlessly about which one is better um, and which one's more likely to be upgradable into the next theory and which one has a better relationship right. with special relativity. Things like this. Right? But you see, that's the point. Without relativity, uh, I would argue that Bohmian mm -hmm. mechanics and standard formulation of quantum mechanics are the same and neither of them are the real thing. The, the reason why I believe that one is better than the other is precisely because of relativity, breaking the symmetry between the two. So I don't know. I'm, I tend to be more conservative, I guess, in terms of declaring which one is the physical fundamental or the one that's closer to a more fundamental description of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there's, there's many questions. Uh, again, lower bound of three, upper bound uh, would be five. So we begin, I think Thales was the first. Actually, are there other people also just related to the discussion that you're having? I can't hear Thales. There's some internal debate now. So, Thales, is everybody okay with Jose going first? It's just because it's entirely related. Jose goes first. Uh, that, 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 in what you're seeing now. Uh, Maybe what I can do is I can mute my computer and you can unmute yours. So Dan, here's better. I think that'd be best. Yeah. Volume down. So only unmute, but don't turn off the volume. No, because otherwise, yeah. Okay. Okay. Volume up. Other oh, looking. Yes. The volume. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, um, one of the arguments that you said, uh, I mean, that, that you used to distinguish whether um, the lattice or the unlimited, we should prefer the lattice or the unlimited, the unlimited version, is that um, you said that with the lattice you get the wrong symmetries. Uh, so I get in that, in that case, for example, you're talking about the, the example that you gave with H4 and H5, uh, in which uh, um, basically first you got a set of symmetries and then uh, you saw that with internalizing, uh, with internalization of yeah, the, the, when you when you transfer the lattice to the to the to the the the, um, the values, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Then um, then you got a, a wider uh, range of symmetries, right? So uh, yeah. I wanted to ask uh, because um, I don't know if I if I saw it correctly, but 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 I think uh, that the, uh, the the symmetries that you add are exactly the same that you would get if you um, if you allowed for um local gauge symmetries like if uh, if instead of uh, only allowing uh, affine transformations uh, a global affine transformation on phi if you still keep phi uh, not not capital phi but just phi as a, as the fundamental object but you also allow for local gauge transformations that allow these affine these affine factors uh, to depend on so on the point of the lattice that you're dealing with then you will get the same i yeah. think it's the same set of symmetries is it that right um no no that's not right no um, what, what, if you let, what, yep, sorry. Um, if you let that be a localized symmetry, um, well, you just don't, you just don't get the same symmetries. Um, I can, maybe I can go back and check. Um, uh, but no, if you if you try and localize the gauge symmetries, you uh, really don't find anything uh, new. Here, um, yeah, as far as I see, the only additional symmetries that you get uh, from uh, the, from generalizing from from taking capital phi instead of uh, phi as fundamental is that the coefficients that you are allowed in the in the transformation in the linear transformations can depend on on the on the on the point that you're applying to, right? Uh, 
is it? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I didn't okay. understand. Uh, so I think I've got the relevant relevant slide up here. Um, yes. In the first interpretation, um, we have, have that line on the middle, s colon um, vector phi goes to c1 p phi t of tau plus c2 1. Right. Yes. Uh, if you if you upgrade to a um, gauge transformation here, what you're allowed to do is to turn that that c two one at the end. When in the second line, we're adding a, a constant one across all of the field values together uniformly. When you upgrade to a gauge thing, those c twos times one turns into a, a just a generic vector in the space. Right. Yes, but also c one b. Transform yeah. to a and then, and then yeah, and also C1. So C1 could also change depending on the lattice site that we're dealing with, but that doesn't give you a general linear transformation there. That C1 turns into a diagonal matrix. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's so true. you have a different rescaling C1 for each of the lattice sites. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So just let me now look at look at equation eleven here. What you're talking about about turning a gauge thing is to to add a subindex to C1 and C2, which depends on L, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah. So all that does is uh, do that. So it's not missing out on gauge stuff here. No, this the 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 symmetries we're hiding in the distinction between the manifold and the value space. So we shif shifting those around gives us new symmetries. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so thanks. That is uh, first. Uh, you should I'll mute and then turn my volume down. And use the volume max. Hello there. Oh, I should volume max. Yeah. Here? My, my, the volume of my computer is off. My, my, that's not going to. Can you like put it like a. Uh, like, uh, oh, no. you just leave your computer with the sound? Oh, that's you, oh, you just mute yourself. I muted, yeah. Wait, then it's not my volume. My volume has nothing to do with yeah, that. Yeah, but my audio was there. I speak back to your microphone, which was out of my. Ah. Uh, Etc. Well, amplification of in fact. The universe would explode if it weren't because there's all a maximum capacity for the amplification all the time. Yeah. That's an exponential amplification. <laughs> like let's spend limited. <laughs> all right. Then can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, you need okay, hold on. We need silence. Yeah, I told you the computer is yeah. Maybe you can use somebody else's computer to talk. Is there a volunteer? I don't know. Can somebody make sure silence or close the silence if there is computer? Oh, I have a chair for myself. Hi, then. Can you can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes. All right. Good. So no, it's it's just some clarification questions actually. So uh, can, can you go to the last pictures that you have, like where you show the different uh, theories and how to evolve them with the? Because uh, when you get there, like it looks to me that what you've shown is that any uh, bend limited theory can be represented in the lattice and vice versa, and no matter what lattice you have. You have this this communication between the two, right? So, for instance, in that in that case, there you um, just have as, as long as, yeah, one technical bit. As long as as long as the lattice is sufficiently dense in the technical yes, sense. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so the, the the fundamental thing there is essentially the amount of points in the lattice versus the depend limit, and that's it, right? If you have this relationship like established, then you can play with one or the other, and you're going to get the same results always, right? Now, the the only um, thing that I'm you need sort of sure. average density spacing thing, yeah. It, I I don't recall exactly the technical condition, but you can look that up. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. But yeah, but here uh, you considered essentially the, the square lattice and the hexagonal lattice, and then you generalize the the theories that you got there using the the nearest neighbors into uh, continuous differential equations for the Dutch broke the, the rotation symmetries and like that the evolution looks a little bit more like the hexagon or the square, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so we, we right? start with the yeah, you start with the square heat equation here, H H four theory. Then you put that in band limited terms, and and you get this uh, band limited this differential equation for the band limited functions. Yeah, and this differential equation doesn't respect rotation symmetry. Fair enough. But so, it does so, when you have uh, the more complicated so, derivatives. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, I just have one thing, which is like so. The thing is, you you obtain different theories if you consider like nearest neighbor interactions in different lattices. And you try to generalize each one of them to the, to the continuum. Do you agree with this statement? Yeah, yeah. 
nearest neighbor on the square lattice is a different theory than nearest neighbor on the hexagonal lattice. That's right. Exactly. So in this sense, can't I say somehow that, like, uh, for instance, if the, the theory of everything was this equation H5, right? Can't I, in mm -hmm. a way, say that this theory privileges the, the, the hexagon lattice? Would you disagree with this if, if someone said something like this and this were the theory of everything? Are, are inertial coordinates privileged in special relativity? All right, perfect. So that's the analogy, essentially. It's like it's a theory in which uh, a specific so there's... Lattices... Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. There are no, no, some, there are some. Lattices. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Right. Yeah, there's a bit of a delay. Sorry. There, given our theory, there are some coordinate systems which are suited particularly well to it. But that doesn't mean the coordinate systems are fundamental. Those are still just representational choices. I mean, there happens to be some, when we, well, I, I think I mentioned this at the start, when we represent our theories, we have a free choice in how we represent them with different coordinate systems. Now, you can use a, a Cartesian coordinate system to represent something rotationally invariant. Now it's nicer to do that in spherical coordinates, uh, but that's just how it goes, you know? So um, the, the, the symmetries of the representation don't have to line up with the symmetries of the thing being represented, right? Okay, I completely agree. That, that's everything I wanted to hear. I think it's, uh, it's very clear to me now. Yeah. Thank you. If you have... Muted. Um, I first just wanted to uh, thank you for sharing this work with us, Dan, because I found this um, really cool stuff um, and I think uh, important work to, I don't know, this, I like how this uh, improved my understanding of lattices and things. Um, I also liked how your paper cleared up some like Covariance can kind of be used vaguely in literature, and I think your paper uh, made explicit some of the vagueness in my head. But in my kind of naive picture of it, I typically view covariance as kind of not treating space or time preferentially. And so I was kind of left wondering uh, this throughout this whole like work about discretizing time and how like mm -hmm. it seems like this relies on a continuous time variable and um i was yeah wondering if you thought about that at all or like what justified kind of leaving that continuous no oh, oh, perfect perfect great great, great, great question. question um i'm uh, hearing feedback there you go okay um uh I'm, I'm i'm writing a second paper about all this stuff where i just basically repeat all of this with the klein gordon equation instead of the heat equation and, and in that example, uh, you can do everything in discrete in both space and time, right? So, so here I'm distinguishing between space and time and doing one continuous and one discrete. That's absolutely a feature of this example, uh, but it's not a feature in general. And I'll, I'll, I'll show that in my next paper. The, the reason you have to, the, the behavior in time here is not uh, periodic, you know, like, the, the, the way that the, the eigen solutions of these equations are decaying or exponentially decaying plane waves in time, right? And the, the exponential behavior in time is just not band limited. And so I can't represent it discreetly. But if you have a Klein Gordon equation, the behavior in time is sinusoidal, periodic, just like it is in space. And so you can do both things discreetly there. Okay, cool. All right, so then the next question is Bruno. So we'll say thing mute and volume zero. Okay, Dan, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I have a comment slash, slash question that I want to hear your thoughts on. So, because I think there are two ways in which you can think of inertial coordinates and lattice analogies. One of them is what you emphasize very well, which is lattices as for as analogous to coordinate systems but you could also say that lattices are also analogous to symmetry generators of some special background so for example if i so the thing is there's nothing special about inertial coordinates in flat space because you can pick whatever coordinates you like but there is some, something special about doing a theory in flat space 
which is that this theory is equipped with such and such giving vector field and so on. That is a coordinate independent statement that privileges or that can, can be used to single out a uh, preferred coordinate yep. system that's derived from that. But it's logically independent from coordinates. It's, it's incorrect to say that inertial coordinates are special in flat space time, but it's still true that flat space time is special because it has so many synergies, right? And I think this, because yeah, yeah, right, when, right. When, you, when you're giving the talk, I, I thought a lot about, you know, when you do solid state physics and you talk about Bragg diffraction, and there is absolutely something special about doing theories in one lattice or the other. And I think the analogy here would be that if you're doing the theory on a particular lattice where you actually have some, you know, atoms sitting at particular points and so on, that would be analogous to have some discrete version of a vector field that is coordinate independent, like you can talk about it coordinate free. And that leads to a different physics than if the lattice was, was something else. Like, I don't know if I formulated the, the idea well enough, but. No, yeah, no, it's a great question. It's a great question. I've got, I've got some things to say about that. Um, if you'll, um, I, I talk about this in the paper. Um, OK, I, I have H4 up on the screen. OK, we have the, the time evolution with H4 right there. Um, you can you can definitely identify what the sort of space time structures there are in the background of this theory. I, I do this in the paper in the I think the band limited general covariance section towards the end. Um, but given taking this um, taking this band limited equation here at the bottom, you can write that in terms of differential geometry, and you can put that in there. But you get some new space time vector fields which point out in the x and y direction. You know. So there are, in this theory of four, there are space-time objects which sort of are there to break the symmetries and point in, in the two directions that we have this sort of square anomaly showing up, right? So absolutely, when you analyze this theory, you take it off of the lattice, put it in a band-limited space, right? Still even there, there are things which are breaking the rotation symmetry. There, and these are the things which give you the killing vectors, right? That point in the x direction and the y direction, yeah? And so definitely those give you out a physically a specified sort of two directions on the plane at every point. So absolutely, at every point on the plane, you have two directions which are specified out against all the others. Um, but that's not the whole, that's not the lattice. We still have continuous translation symmetries along any of those killing vectors, right? So we, we, have, um, we have these killing vectors which are perpendicular to each other and point across the whole of the space and the time. Uh, but they don't pick out where the lattice points are, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I do work this up in particular in, in one part of the paper where I, because I, once, once you do this discrete general covariance move and get rid of the lattice structure, you can then just apply regular general covariance to it and take your theory and write it in terms of differential geometry. And once you do both of those, it really fully exposes what the geometric structure of your theory is. And when you do that, it's not a lattice which is underlying it. You may get some killing vectors which break your symmetries in certain ways, um, but but uh, you don't find a lattice when you do that. Yeah. There we go. All right, I'm doing it. So Dan, are you there? Yeah, I'm yeah. here. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Let me just switch the video. Thank you very much, Dan. That was uh, actually a great talk and a great topic. And I think this work is actually super cool. And um, mm -hmm. I uh, look forward to what the future brings in terms of what you do, in terms of what it inspires everybody to do. Let's thank uh, Dan again. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. I'll stop the recording.